<sighs> well, Bedlam, on the off chance you're able to hear me right now, it looks like you've got nothing to worry about. I never expected I'd be handed down a job so important, but I'm not going to be taking it lightly. You've left the fate of the Chaos Emeralds resting in some very capable hands. So, it looks like this adventure has come to a close. Oh, but that just means another one's getting started, right? <laughs> and I guess that's it. Sonic Stop Motion Adventures, a series I started in my bedroom when I was 11 years old, inspired by the likes of Sonic Toast and Retro Dynamics. In the beginning, it was nothing more than me, a few Sonic toys, and a somewhat lacking digital camera. Over the years, the camera and figures themselves changed, along with the entirety of the creative process. But even after all this time, one thing remained the same. I was essentially a one-man team, telling stories through the medium of stop-motion animation. Over time, the series became just another part of my life, a rare constant in a world full of variables. I matured, and my techniques followed suit. Comparing the first and last episodes feels like night and day, so drastically different in terms of scope, animation, voice acting, editing, pretty much everything. Episode 1 went up on May 23rd, 2009, and the series finale on October 20th, 2018. That's a solid 9 years and some change. I sometimes wonder how my 11-year-old self would have reacted if he was told some tiny little hobby would become such a big part of his life. He'd probably be thrilled. Long ago, I had the idea to show off the entire, beginning-to-end process of making an episode of Sonic Stop Motion Adventures. And on the eve of starting production on 26 and 27, with my skills at peak performance and just shy of 10 years of experience, I knew that now was the right time. This is the making of the end of Sonic Stop Motion Adventures. Saying that the show started out completely unscripted probably doesn't come as a surprise. I vividly remember taking pictures of the figures with only some vague idea of the story and what they would be saying to each other. Afterwards, I'd skim through every shot and record the voices. It was freeform and scattered. Needless to say, things changed quite a bit. Now, writing is the start of everything. The only restriction being staying within the confines of what I can physically do with stop motion and the way each character can move. Thankfully, by this point, it was a handicap I was well adjusted to. The ideas for both episode 26 and episode 27 had been in my mind and in jotted down note form for about two years prior to production even beginning, maybe even longer than that. I knew that the series was going to end with Bedlam, and even knew while working on episode 25 what events would follow. The time it took to write both scripts, however, varied drastically with episode 26 taking just about two months on and off to complete, and episode 27 taking only six days. This is in part due to rewriting and restructuring a lot of episode 26, compared to 27 where I changed very little. Most of episode 27 was already written in my head, so when it came to actually writing those scenes, it was like I couldn't get it typed out fast enough. Episode 26 was very much a setup for episode 27, and in a way, was the hardest part of the writing process. Once 26's script was completed, it was practically all downhill from there. But of course, once both episodes are written, the real work begins. Actually getting started with shooting was quite the struggle, as my family had a lot of big home repair projects going on at that time, including tearing up the entire floor. Not to mention a lot of poor weather with no sunshine and a broken camera remote to boot. But on December 4th, 2017, the skies parted and I was finally able to start shooting for real. Scene 1 was pretty standard, all things considered. Just conversational animation between two characters on a set that only featured one new building. An important scene, but one short enough to shoot entirely in one session, with no additional lighting required. 
I didn't start using artificial lighting in the form of lamps until episode 21, but even then they were only for when I needed specific looks, and I continued to shoot primarily with natural lighting for a majority of the series. Despite this, I did try using lamps and shooting this scene at night, going for an early evening appearance, but it didn't quite work out. In this scene, there's only one new set piece, which is the Digiphobia record store that's behind Bedlam and Big while they're talking. Uh, I just wanted to make at least one new uh, with recycling old buildings. It's kind of the one that's in the center, so it's it's uh, it's fine to use, you know, recycled ones around it. Uh, the name Digiphobia is a reference to Cage the Elephant's Melophobia, uh, the sign I even designed in a similar fashion, and put some uh, cool record-related pictures all over it, so I'm happy with how it came out. It's simple, but I think it, it does its job. In terms of all the scenes in the last two episodes, about half were shot with natural lighting, and the other half were shot using lamps. Both parts of Tails' lab are shot using the latter. With this scene, I wanted to convey the feeling on the eve of the big event, with Sonic, Shadow, and Silver training together, and Tails working on finishing Variable S. The key was to contain this all at the same location, so I introduced Tails' basement as a sort of makeshift training spot, with a PA system linking to the lab above. That way they can communicate, but are removed enough not to interfere with each other. This meant two completely separate sets shot at different times, as building one on top of another would have been a big waste of effort and just plain inefficient. The above-ground Tails' lab set actually received no major changes compared to how it appeared in previous episodes. Tails' basement, however, was an entirely new set, one that I wanted to look the part. Kinda drab, not really decorated at all, mostly bare walls. I filled the space with miscellaneous items and furniture, stuff that Tails wouldn't necessarily mind being thrown around during their training. The kicker here was the staircase, which gives the illusion of something being above, when truthfully, nothing is. If it weren't for that, this would have just looked like any other normal room, especially since every scene of the show is shot on the same table. There was actually a failed attempt to shoot this scene on my kitchen counter instead of the usual table, mostly because I had another scene set up on that table but still wanted to shoot. I got about 80 frames in before realizing it wasn't working at all. All the prison scenes were shot together, including the final moment between Sonic and Robotnik, which was completed five months before I started shooting anything else from episode 27. Back when I jailed Robotnik at the end of episode 23, I knew that's where he was going to stay. The show's conflict and main antagonist had shifted from him to the Emeralds and Bedlam, so it would have been arbitrary to break him out. Debuting in episode 24, I designed this set to be as organic as possible in relation to getting the angles I wanted. The walls were simply untouched cardboard boxes, and the jail bars were made by stacking a bunch of these grey Lego pieces together, then connecting them to a plank of cardboard with mounting putty. They weren't connected to the floor at all, which meant any time I had to rearrange for a shot, it was as simple as possible. Shooting the big fight in the abandoned city began on December 7th, 2017, and didn't conclude until April 21st, 2018. Granted, I wasn't shooting every day, and sometimes home repairs delayed it all together, but the fact of the matter is that over half of episode 26 takes place here, much of it consisting of combat that was very time-consuming to shoot. Speaking of the fight, this scene was rewritten the most out of the last two episodes, and I think holds the record for how many times I've rewritten fight choreography. In early drafts, several additional characters joined the fight against Bedlam, including Blaze, the Radniks, the Chaotix, and Zalvandor was even going to jump in just like Metal Sonic. I think I realized it was too much and I didn't feel up for animating all those characters to begin with, so I kept it lighter and even addressed this in the episode. The entire point of this is to prove that we're worthy of the emeralds. If it takes getting a bunch of reinforcements to do that, then it kind of defeats the purpose. This might be my favorite set that I've ever made. 
I was going for a cross between an abandoned city and an unfinished construction site, with the buildings torn up and warning signs placed all over. Some buildings got an added level of dimension, especially the one that Bedlam gets knocked into, and the one that Supersonic explodes from, which also features an upper level that some of the fight takes place on. Shooting with Bedlam and Shadow up there involved moving and isolating that individual building, and anchoring it down with tape so it would stay still while shooting. The largest building in the background was made from a big cardboard display. I slapped more cardboard to the front, making it seem like an incomplete building with the different floors intact on the inside. Since it was a one-time set, I didn't really mind destroying it throughout shooting, with characters slamming through buildings or hitting walls and leaving damage behind. To make them not look completely drab, I drew and colored graffiti street art on some of the buildings. I figured if this was a real abandoned spot, taggers would have probably been all over it at this point. Not only was it my favorite set, but also one of the largest and most complex. Whenever possible, I would keep this thing up for multiple days at a time, and when I would take it down, I'd snap several pictures to be able to match continuity in the future. The offshoot with Sonic, Tails, and Amy inside the building was shot on its own, with practically just a corner of cardboard to represent the inside walls, and a flashlight dangling above for lighting. Shooting as a whole is something that usually takes several hours at a time, and I typically only stop when my natural lighting is beginning to fade. Because of this, I'm almost always listening to music, so silence doesn't drive me insane. Packing up all the sets when I finish is no small feat either. I mean, you yeah. don't have to go like crazy over the top or anything, but it's like it is a yelly line. Yeah, it's, I understand. I should, like, technically, I should have the training to keep myself safe in this situation. Um, this time I'm sitting. I, I wonder, this is like a weird actor thing, but I wonder when I watch the episode if I'm going to know when I started sitting. My desired appearance for the moderator dimension was a combination of otherworldly and simplistic. Early on, I had the idea of making it completely white, but decided against it as it probably would have looked too boring. Not to mention I did something very similar back in episode 18. I came up with what is seen in the final product, with two large display boards making up the walls, which vaguely resemble the shape of a Chaos Emerald. The colored pillars were added in order to relate it to the Chaos Emeralds themselves, with spots cut out in each one, almost implying that the emeralds were forged from them. Underneath, I used a black floor in order to differentiate it from normal scenes taking place on Earth, since after episode 19, I rarely ever used black floors. I also used lamps to achieve a different look than normal, which meant I could shoot at night and for much longer than I did in the abandoned city. It only took me six sessions to shoot everything in the moderator dimension, compared to the 19 sessions it took me to capture the entire main scene in episode 26. Initially, I had planned to set the Zalvandor cutaway in another part of town, but ended up choosing to do a real-life background environment for the very first time. It makes him seem like more of a nomad that way, removed from anything ever seen in the show. The actual environment is in the mountains just a few minutes from my house, right around where I filmed a few videos before. I tried to match lighting and make it look as seamless as I could. For the shot showing just his feet, I added layering and a very slight shadow underneath in an attempt to give it more dimension. Shooting in Sonic's house has always been simple, and that extends to its final appearance. The main piece that has the bed is all one unit, so whenever I need a different angle, I was able to turn it with ease. In all shots with the door, this piece was turned a different direction than normal. Speaking of the door, it does actually open and close, but getting individual frames of it doing so can be pretty tricky since it doesn't stay in position. My workaround was just to use a little ball of putty to hold it in place. The party at Amy's house is split between three sets, exterior, interior, and balcony. Where everyone convenes outside was based on the exterior in episodes 14 and 15. However, I made modifications to account for how many figures would be there, and made new flowers for the little garden. 
Similar to the in-building offshoot in 26, this is a great example of a corner set, with no structures existing outside of what is essential and seen on camera, which here is just two walls, making a corner where the garden is. Some of the characters' vehicles are very briefly shown, as I thought it added a little bit of depth, implying they had driven to Amy's house. The upstairs interior is the set I wanted to go all out with. Not only was it a party, but it was one of the last things seen in the series, so if there was ever a time to splurge, it was now. Most of the props, like a vast majority of the food, the tables, flowers, and the couch, were all purchased specifically for this scene alone. I found that balloon cake toppers worked really well as, well, balloons, and I also threw a bunch of pom-poms everywhere to further cement the look of a party. After all, I needed something after trying and failing to include streamers and paper chains. Similarly, I had intended for all the characters to be wearing party hats, but couldn't cut them to make them look quite right. I even wrote and recorded a line mentioning it before removing this aspect altogether. Oh, what's up, Shadow? I like your hat. The party was lit with my two usual lamps, in addition to a more professional, stand-up light with an umbrella pointed downward. Before I had even started writing the last two episodes, I knew that the last scene of the show was going to be Sonic and Tails on the balcony, and I had a very specific idea in mind of how I wanted it to look. Matching that came down to finding the right balcony piece, and thankfully I didn't have to look for very long. An eBay user listed a custom-made Fisher-Price balcony for cheap, which I jumped on in early October of 2017, before I had even completed writing on episode 26. The only other piece was an unfinished wooden window frame, and with a few modifications, like bringing the guardrail down low enough, Cutting a doorway in the window, and then gluing it onto the balcony, the final set piece was complete. When I shot this final scene, I moved the entire party set back, keeping it completely intact. This included the lamps that lit that set, which remained the only source of light. This was so I could achieve the real look of the only light to be seen coming from inside Amy's house, as in-universe it was now nighttime. Okay, it is currently Tuesday, August 7th at 2.28 a.m. There is a very loud cricket in my house, but on a more important note, I have just taken the final frame of Sonic Stop Motion Adventures. <laughs> oh my god. It doesn't really feel real yet, but like... <laughs> and now I gotta take all this down. When it came to ending my show, I knew that introducing my own character as the final antagonist was the only direction I wanted to take. The first chapter of Bedlam's creation dates all the way back to 2012, where I was drawing out of boredom in my high school freshman biology class. I was just messing around with some new character design, which wasn't rare per se, but this one I ended up really liking. So much so, that I made a powered up version shortly after. Fast forward to that summer break. My friend AJ and I had started working on plans for a crossover special between my Sonic Stop Motion Adventures and his Speed Stories series. Multiple Skype calls between us revolved around coming up with the story and writing the script. In terms of conflict, we wanted to take the avenue of something completely original, so we incorporated the character I designed with plans of getting figures customized. It was here that I made the first design revision to the character, who AJ and I had named RV. This stood for Random Villain, and funnily enough, the uploads of his original design on my DeviantArt, which are still up to this day, are under this name. Both versions now more closely resembled his final design, in terms of colors and head shape. 
Sometime after, the crossover special AJ and I were writing was shelved, as we no longer truly believed in the material. Around the same time, I had begun thinking I didn't want my character to be limited to a one-off special, so AJ and I agreed that I would take the character for myself. 2013 is when his design was finalized, getting rid of the bionic eye and additional accessories, in order to simplify him so a figure would actually look decent. Fast forward to when I received the customized figures in 2014, where they sat on my shelf for years before I put the finale plan into motion. You know this uh, entire Sonic the Hedgehog collection, uh, 2015? July 2015. They've just been chilling. He's just been chilling there, dude. Changing his name was crucial because RV just sounds strange, and it no longer worked for the direction I was taking the character. I chose Bedlam, due to it being a synonym of chaos, and the definition, a scene of uproar or confusion, awfully fitting for how he appears in the series. His backstory was always intertwined with the Chaos Emeralds, and in brainstorming I had come up with the ideas of him being their creator, or even being a physical manifestation made by them. In the end though, I took the moderator route because I felt it was the one I could do the most with, especially with Sonic becoming his successor, which was a much later addition in the story. Back when Bedlam was known as RV, and AJ and I were writing a crossover involving him, I had reached out to Omidon to play the part. Omidon has been doing voice work for several years now, but in the Sonic community he is known well for voicing the character Nazo in Chakra X's Nazo Unleashed. I've been waiting much too long for this moment. Much too long indeed. You use the Chaos Emeralds too often! Years had passed after that and I wanted to take the character in a different direction. Now, my first and only choice when it came to giving Bedlam a voice was Evan, also known as Mardiculous. You don't understand the abuse that you're all guilty of. Don't get so hot-headed. Evan was a joy to work with from start to finish, and exercised great care when it came to understanding this character so he could deliver his best performance. Oh yeah, 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 Mr. Ultimate Life Form. You know, I'm not gonna exaggerate that much, but it'll help me. Like, no, yeah, yeah, totally. Because he doesn't care, it's downplaying it, yeah. Like, okay. oh, that's your title, huh? Mr. Ultimate Life Form. But this is in action, so he's more energetic than he was before. Uh, yes. The figures were made by popular figure customizer Wake Angel 2001, who had previously built up quite the reputation for customizing figures in general, but specifically characters in the Sonic style. With his help, I was able to bring my character into existence. Although I did cut off and rearrange a lot of the spines in his head. As you can see, the top spine points forward and his two bottom spines point downwards. With a little bit of sculpting, it looks, uh, you know, we pretty much got the look down. Title cards are something I started way back in episode 8, and over the years I had developed a formula for them. The characters I sketched and inked by hand, then scanned and colored digitally. I have no experience using a tablet, so I actually did all the digital coloring with only a mouse. Initially, it wasn't the greatest, but over time I improved quite a bit. Editing. Far and away the most time-consuming portion, but also where I'm able to truly see my vision come to life, which makes it one of the best parts. The skeleton of everything is the raw animation, which at this point was not at all a challenge to edit. Over the years I've been asked what frame rate I edit in, the answer to which is 29.9 rounded up to 30. But on the timeline of any episode, it's easy to notice that not all frames are the same length. Instead, they jump back and forth between 1s and 2s, which I decided around the time of episodes 19 and 20 is the best way for me to animate given the way that I shoot. The largest undertaking was without a doubt the PNG editing I did in Photoshop. To make characters jump and fly, others often use chroma keying, sometimes referred to as green screening, a process of replacing a colored backdrop with transparency. 
Making amateur chroma key look good can be difficult, however, especially since I use natural lighting. I used to just edit wires or even my hands out of frames, which looked... not good. So I switched over to cutting out images as PNGs, which are image files that allow for transparency. That way they can be added in Vegas as a separate layer. This is the method I kept for the rest of the show, and it is much more time consuming than chroma keying, because I manually cut out every single frame in Photoshop individually, and I don't even use quick selection tools. Across both episodes, there were approximately 2,250 character frames I cut out. If I consider an average of two and a half minutes to cut out each frame, I get 5,625 minutes, which rounding up equates to 94 hours. Approximately 94 hours devoted solely to cutting out PNGs. Time consuming? Absolutely. But I was devoted to keeping the look consistent and I was able to watch a lot of movies, shows, and videos while I did all this. Editing this way served as a solution to many obstacles. Take this shot here. Knuckles and Sonic were shot separately, then Sonic was cut out and layered over a blurred and panning background. Where this comes to life is when Sonic is motion tracked across the screen. This shot here was done in a similar way only on top of a moving background that had an animated motion blur. Cutting out the frames isn't hard, and the only challenge here came from getting the timing right in relation to making Sonic not appear too floaty or too heavy. For Shadow removing his inhibitor rings, I took a pair of Sonic hands and painted the cuffs black. I used a different Shadow figure with these hands for this portion, except for the very first shot where he flicks off the rings which required some digital editing. I shot the motion normally with the base shadow figure, and then took pictures of the alternate hands at the same angles. Then, I cut out those and layered them over Shadow's normal hands, which involved a fair amount of touch-up. For two really quick shots, a lot of work went into them, and full power Shadow was a ton of work as a whole. I never intended for him to appear red throughout the entire sequence, but once I saw how it looked, I knew it was too cool to pass up. This meant biting the bullet and cutting out every frame of shadow, layering them, and then adding the color effects in Vegas. This is one of the last things I did in editing for both episodes. A lot of effects get reused between characters, like homing attack trails, which are all the same image just changed in color. Similarly, when a character powers up, the same three aura effects are used. The backing and front auras are After Effect presets made by a man named Gil Hermy, also known as Zelitis. The third layer is a simple repeating particle effect I made, seen on Supersonic and Super Shadow at all times. It's not always about how many effects you use, but rather how much you can get from the same ones while making them look different enough. I developed the new Chaos Control effect to be more dynamic than ones in the past. It typically lasts 12 frames total, balanced on either end with two different shots, one with the character in frame, and the other without. Both get timed levels effects with the input end sliding down on the first frame, then sliding back up on the second. In simpler terms, this is what causes the bright flash in the effect. But it's important that I use levels instead of brightness contrast, as levels is far more versatile. The only additional layer is an inverted copy of one of the frames thrown on top and directly in between the flashing ones. I give it an even fade on both ends, and then boom, that's really all there is to it. For Sonic, Chaos Control is more blue, and for Shadow in his full power state, more red. When Bedlam uses Chaos Control in his frantic state, it's tinted purple. I also added light rays and shortened it all together to reflect his higher power. Originally, I wanted Metal Sonic to project a static hologram of Robotnik during his message, but found it to be a little too complicated for its own good. The waveform approach seemed much more dynamic. I started by adding a glow around Metal Sonic's eyes in Photoshop, then removing the eyes altogether. For the waveform, I simply opened Robotnik's lines in VLC Media Player, where I was able to view them with an audio visualizer. Sonic, if you're hearing this pre-recorded message, then everything must have gone according to my plan. 
Recording that and keying out the background, it was sandwiched between the picture of Metal Sonic with transparent eyes and a solid white. It took some time to get the look I had set out to accomplish, but was very worth it, and it became one of my favorite effects in the finale. Chaos Control! Shooting the final collision in 26 was incredibly easy, because it was only a few shots with absolutely no movement from the figures. Editing is where it came to life. The first step was placing two copies of each shot on the timeline, one directly on top of the other. I inverted one of each, chopped them up, and then added a gradient swirl wipe. Upon rendering that as its own file, I was able to add the shaking. Anytime I add shakes like this, it's done in the pan crop menu with manual keyframes. As the final spice of instability, I took short random bits of the clip and messed around with them with mirroring and deforming to get it to look really distorted. No! No, there's no way! What is this? Hypersonic was not only one of the elements I was most excited to show off, but also the product of hours and hours of tedious editing. I never painted an actual figure. Instead, the look was accomplished completely digitally, by using the selective color and black and white effects in Photoshop. So yes, this means that every single frame that Hypersonic moves was another one to manually edit this way. It took a lot of time. I had decided fairly early on to illustrate Hypersonic as completely white. It seemed like the cleanest and most visually appealing way of doing so. But I still wanted that element of flashing colors that the form is so well known for. So I gave him this technique of using sort of after-image doppelgangers that were also the colors of the seven emeralds. They weren't all that difficult to make, either. I already had cut out PNGs of Hypersonic, all I had to do from there was colorize them seven different times. In Vegas, they all received glows in their respective color, and the opacity was lowered to 77%. To finish off, I chopped them up so they flashed every other frame. HYPERSONIC BOOM! The Hypersonic Boom finisher was, again, just a few frames flashed over and over in different ways. The background cut between the actual moderator dimension and solid black and white. The emeralds appear in certain frames, hypersonic cycled between the normal appearance and colored ones, and some frames appeared as just black and white, bar the energy effect. This moment, much like the final punch collision in episode 26, is a prime example of how many little adjustments can come together to form something that looks more complex than it really is. Well, that was new! The bulk of the editing is the obvious. All those effect-heavy moments of characters flying around, powering up, and throwing energy blasts. But several areas that seem minor in comparison add up to quite a bit of additional editing. Take mouths, for example. Adding one animated mouth is simple, but adding them throughout the entirety of both episodes is incredibly tedious and indeed time-consuming. Not to mention, they appeared much more frequently this time around, because I found it so jarring to look back at older episodes and see them show up so selectively. After motions are animated, I'll motion track a single frame to stay on the character while they move. Sometimes there are only a few frames to do this for, other times there are many. When I brought mouths back into the series, I made cycles that I could use universally between scenes, by making them a separate layer from the animation. When it comes to opening and closing, there are four frames in total for each cycle. The key is keeping an eye on the waveform of what the character is saying while animating them, and always varying how many frames are cycled through. But it doesn't always have to match completely. The focus of the scene isn't the mouth, it's the characters. As long as it looks good, or even half decent, roll with it. Blinks are something I started doing out of pure spectacle. To determine where characters will blink, I'll scan through and find areas where there's little to no movement, write down all the frames, and then load them into Photoshop. From there, I select the area around the character's eyes and gradually fill it with a matching color. Each blink typically gets three frames, 
sometimes four or five if it's meant to be slower. Rinse and repeat the process for every time a character blinks, then export them as PNGs. I throw those back on top of the original frames and voila, characters are now blinking. My goal is to add them frequently, but not so often that it's distracting. All about finding the sweet spot. When shooting scenes, errors happen. It's only natural, but sometimes I can fix them very easily in post-production. For example, in scene 2, I accidentally bumped some objects on Tails' desk and had a shot where Sonic's arm moved once between frames where I didn't want it to. This causes inconsistency. But if I take one of those frames into Photoshop, I can cut and make a mask to be layered over the original frames. This keeps the viewer from ever noticing there was something wrong in the first place. Most of these changes aren't very noteworthy, with the exception of Zalvandor near the end of episode 27. The figure is very flimsy, and in the raw frames, it leaned down more and more as I animated Sonic. Now that isn't anything new, but funnily enough, it also appears that some tiny bug found its way onto the set and crawled over Zalvandor's foot while I shot. Here, I kept the mask frame more broad and included the background, and blurred the edges so it wouldn't be a sharp dividing line between the original frame and the mask. In the series' infancy, my sound effect library was extremely limited. Over time, that changed, leading to my current sound library of over 50,000 individual sound effects from many different sources. As that changed, I started taking sound editing as a whole much more seriously. It can be intensive to say the least. Just look at the timeline around combat sections. I'll rarely only use one sound effect for something. Most of the time, it's a bunch of different ones added together. For example, the sound I put together for Chaos Control. And when a character Chaos Controls into frame, the sound is reversed. I even made two different versions of each, with the audio being panned in different directions. I used them interchangeably depending on where the character was Chaos Controlling from or where they were going, relative to the screen. Around the beginning of Season 3, I developed a process I call tinting, which involves five separate effects. Levels, Brightness Contrast, Saturation Adjust, Sharpen, and Color Balance. Practically every scene, no matter how different in appearance, uses these five effects. Levels I use to dim the frame, since I typically shoot with an intentionally somewhat high white balance. In my experience, it's easier to make something bright darker than to make something dark brighter and keep it looking natural. I used to use the Brightness and Contrast tool for this alone, but it's far too strong of an effect with just one tick on the slider, so it remained on standby as additional support for scenes that needed stronger changes. Saturation Adjust makes the colors pop more. Sharpen makes the frames appear crisper. It's a small effect that goes a long way. Comparing the finale episodes to another one, like episode 20, the difference is very apparent. Sure, I wasn't tinting at all back then, but the older episode frames almost look too soft, and even kind of out of focus despite being shot in focus. Sharpen helps alleviate that and gives the frames a much sleeker look. If I had an even better camera, I would probably not need this effect at all. Color balance may be the most important in the tinting process, next to levels. Because I use natural lighting, raw frames typically come out with a slightly yellowish tint, which I account for here when I increase the amount of blue. For regularly shot and lit scenes like Bedlam in the City, The Fight in 26, Sonic's House, etc., I'll set the blue slider to around the same value. Something noticeable in the finale episodes, however, is the variation in appearance between many of the scenes. For example, Tails' lab and basement. The bottom portion was as simple as applying all the other regular effects, but increasing red on the color balance instead of the usual blue. For the above portion, instead of dimming it, I did the complete opposite and made it brighter with levels, and even desaturated it, which I almost never do. I wanted to go for a washed out, fluorescent light look, and hopefully that came across. My goal for the moderator dimension was to achieve an otherworldly look, which wouldn't have been the case if I left it untouched from how the raw frames came out. 
The two big changes here were in saturation adjust and color balance, of which I took the usual adjustment numbers and almost tripled them. Unfortunately, all of these effects added to these scenes magnified the artifacts in the black floor, but all things considered, I'm really happy with how the look of this place came out. For the final scene exterior, I wanted to believably show that it was around the time of sunset, or even twilight, resulting in one of the most drastic changes to be made in tinting in either episode. In color balance, I dragged the green slider down, and then added the color correction effect where I dragged the high section over to purple. It took me a while to get the look right, but it was a lot of fun to experiment with. The interior had to be really colorful and bright. It was a party with all the characters at the end of the series, after all. Brightness was once again increased instead of dimmed, and the saturation was brought up a significant amount. Finally, the balcony scene received very little in terms of the entire tinting process. The only striking visual difference was bringing down the blue in color balance instead of increasing it. The lighting and everything else didn't need much adjustment. Over the years, I got better at altering images digitally, and was able to improve on the tinting process. It should be noted that for parts that have separate layers, like Sonic jumping through the air or a character blinking, they need the tinting effects applied as well, except for Sharpen, because it will automatically sharpen all edges of transparent PNGs, which does not look good by anyone's standards. When watching any of my recent episodes, tinting or color correction isn't something that everyone thinks about necessarily, but it without a doubt makes my show visually complete, and remains very important. One year of hard work later, episodes 26 and 27 finally premiered on October 13th and 20th, respectively. Sometimes YouTube comment sections can really suck, that's just a reality. But that wasn't the case here, not at all. The outpouring support and sharing of memories that I saw made everything worth it in a way. There were many that had actually grown up with my show, much like how I grew up while making it. Reading people's comments about how they found the show and reminiscing about specific moments was one of the most surreal experiences I've had. Through all of those comments though, one question was ever present. One that I knew was coming and one that I was prepared to answer. Why was I ending the show? Plain and simply, the time was right for me. I had written the series to a point that I was happy with and I felt like I had done everything that I wanted to. That's the difference between cancellation and conclusion. Instead of having the rug pulled up from underneath me, I calmly stepped off, rolled the rug up myself, and tucked it away because its time had come to an end. The first episode was uploaded in May of 2009, and the finale was uploaded in October of 2018. That's almost 10 years of my life, so if there was ever a time to step off and roll up the rug, it was now. Production on the last two episodes as a whole was grueling, and there were many times during it where my life revolved around finishing. After seeing the finished products and hearing everything I've had to say thus far, it might come as a surprise when I say that they almost didn't happen. Back in December of 2017 to about February of 2018, I wasn't doing very well. Happenings in my personal life had caused me to slip into a depressive episode, that time was right as production was just beginning, and I remember specifically in editing only being up to the start of the Tales' basement scene, which is scene 2 of episode 26. It was at this point where I began losing the drive to continue. In the past, my series served as an anchoring point, something for me to lean on regardless of what was bothering me in other aspects of life, but I wasn't feeling that this time. And while it wasn't the main reason, the incredible workload that was on the path in front of me did not help things. I stopped caring and started putting together some type of escape plan. I was genuinely entertaining the thought of abandoning ship. Releasing the scripts as they were, not bothering to shoot, animate, or voice act anything else. 
That way people would know how the story ended, but I wouldn't have to continue working on something while I was doubting myself. While thinking this over, I stepped away and tentatively quit the project for about a month. Time that I used to clear my head and focus on other parts of life while not worrying about what I needed to shoot or edit and so on. I almost quit everything and let the final stretch slip away from me. But I didn't. When I came back to the project, I was filled with energy to keep bringing my ideas to life. I wasn't completely over the problems that had temporarily stalled me, but I was working with passion in spite of them. And all I can say is that I'm so thankful I did. I can't imagine what it would have been like to pull the plug on everything right before it was going to conclude. Not only would it have been a disservice to the people that have watched my content for years, but it would have been a disservice to myself. I know that if I would have gone through with releasing the scripts and not finishing, it would have eaten me up inside, and as a creator I would have considered it a horrible, horrible mistake. The experience taught me a lot. To persevere, to have a vision and bring it into reality. To be thankful for the hardships that life places in front of you, not so you can hit them and grind to a halt, but so you can view them as hurdles to be leapt over, and continue doing the very best that you can. To some, this appears as nothing more than a silly animated show on YouTube, but it was an enormous part of my life that continued growing over time. I started completely alone, but ended up with community. I've met some of my closest friends through doing this, friends that I wouldn't trade for the world. If there's any message that I want people to take away from what this process has been like for me, it would be this. Find your creative outlet. Find that thing to participate in that frees you, gives you joy, the thing that lets you express yourself. Whether it's writing, painting, knitting, sculpting, illustration, animation, film, or anything in between. Find that outlet you are most passionate about and keep your hands busy, because if you do, you aren't an aspiring creator, you are a creator. Never underestimate what simply starting something can do for you, even if it feels so minuscule, so incomprehensibly minute and meaningless in the grand scheme of things, it has the potential to become one of the most important things in your life. Keep dreaming, keep doing, keep your head up, and keep on. For one last time, I'm PiplupFan77. Thank you for watching something that has meant so much to me. I'll be seeing you on the other side.